Dear listener, you may have noticed things going a little quiet on the Corb front of late. For those of you who are still obsessed, here's an episode that we'd had, um, we've had kicking around for a bit. It's been in, it's been in development hell, or, or editing hell, rather. A few months. Yeah. <laughs> editing hell is just when I edit them. Uh, the other thing is that we want to say thank you very much to everyone who signed up to our Patreon at patreon.com slash about underscore buildings. It's going really well. We've reached our first milestone um, and yeah, it's fantastic. We've, it's great. We're now no longer paying to do the podcast. It's, it's very exciting. We've been we've put up our first bit of bonus content and we've got lots more to come we'll have something going up for this episode we'll have to work out what it's going to be though if you haven't already go over to the patreon and have a look uh it's three dollars a month it's it's always going to be supporting the main podcast not the other way around the core the core will be the same it's gonna be free and for everyone luke's luke's looking a bit perplexed but it'd be better if you pay <laughs> yeah much better if you pay much better you get all that quality extra content Okay. Enjoy. Yeah, enjoy the, the episode. Enjoy the episode. Modern design. You're listening to a podcast about buildings and cities. I'm Luke Jones. And I'm George Gingell. The villas which Le Corbusier built during the second half of the 1920s represent the full development of a set of theories and ideas which he'd been working out since the start of his career. In 1926, Corbusier and Pierre Genere released a pamphlet called Five Points Towards a New Architecture, which they framed as a set of theoretical considerations based on many years of practical experience. The villas which he worked on this period, like the villas Meyer, Stein, Savoie, are more than just icons of modernist architecture. In the post-war decades, in commentaries and critiques, ranging from Colin Rowe's essays of the 40s and 50s to Bernard Schumi's advertisements for architecture in the 70s, they effectively stand in for the age of modernism itself as synonyms for its aims and its program in this episode we want to look at those buildings and also talk about what they're actually like how they relate to the principles which he'd set out during this period and how his approach to villa building or develops over these years towards its essential fulfillment in the most iconic project of all the villa savoir in 1929 our first famous building yeah and it's an icon it's a symbol isn't it we have some previous discussions of these things, but maybe we can just briefly recap on a couple of really significant points in, in the development. In 1914, he'd come up with this programme of the, the Maison Domino, which is this idea of an industrially mass-produced concrete house, which can be flexibly arranged on sites, uh, hence the name, so you sort of lay it out like dominoes. But he'd had in there a nod towards a structural skeleton that you can then dress in plan and elevation, how you like. So a bit can be glazed or not glazed, or functions can slip around and things like that. So it's a skeleton plus. Yeah. Um, and then he'd had the Maison Citroën, which is this, again, this kind of industrially mass-produced house, which is, again, is sort of really about mass production. Domino was really an idea about structure, and Citroën was really an idea about what that modern house actually is. In, in the housiness, the relationship with car. Starting to lift it off the ground, yeah, yeah, these kinds of things. We sort of established those as a starting point. The first project which I think we should look at is this one called the the uh, Villa Church, which is really a, a sort of set of several projects for a pair of American clients, Henry and Barbara Church, which were carried out from about 1926 onwards and this isn't necessarily absolutely the first of the projects that we're going to look at but it's important because it represents the end point for an approach which we'd seen explored previously in the Villa La Roche so the site of the Villa Church is the grounds of this existing quite grand well sort of relatively grand neoclassical house in the suburb of Paris 
and what he was building for them were a series of guest pavilions so they were a wealthy couple doing some entertaining and they were they were kind of places for people to sleep and they were also places and pavilions to accentuate the enjoyment of the grounds the house features in a film made in 1929 by the filmmaker Pierre Chenal called L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, I think, and it's it shows a lot of shots of these people running around in leotards. We can be forgiven for not having visited this one because it's, it was demolished in the 1960s. It's quite a strange project, and I think the part we focus on is this largest guest pavilion which occupies and sort of defines a corner of the grounds. It is a little bit reminiscent of La Roche in the sense that it's a it's an L-shaped plan. It's quite interesting because it's quite unlike stuff which he had done before or stuff that he would go on to do in some ways. They're sort of significantly built into and around these existing historic buildings. So there's one here where there's the first story, which he's essentially, I think, built something on top of, which has this very strongly expressed kind of raked masonry on the ground story and then it's got this white box which is sitting on top of it there's an unbuilt proposal which was to entirely surround one of these existing buildings with a terrace not at ground floor but at first floor level which is kind of quite well, quite weird and almost looks like something from you know it looks like something from the 80s it looks like a sort of an Eisenman proposal or something. But I think it's also reaching back. I think the notion of having this big plinth under which you've got your utilities, which then creates a grand centrepiece, is it's a, it's a very classical thing to do as well. Um, but he's obviously doing it in the modern style. We have very little information on most of these pavilions. There are a few photos and a few sketches. Well, I mean, the things you can tell about them, they have... Like La Roche, they have these gardens on the roof. Maybe what's more significant about it is that there's a certain approach which is about arranging quite a number of distinct volumes together in different ways. So that the L is defined at different points in the design by like a series of sort of cuboids and then volumes which bridge between them and then sort of brise soleil, which are sometimes articulated as part of the part of it, like a given volume and part sometimes they're not i would say this whole project it's picturesque you've got a english style garden on a classical site walled you have a series of pavilions which are arranged to be seen in the landscape and the main building that was built itself is composed of a series of elements fitting into the wall of the site which move up and down against each other and seem to be very articulated around circulation views, but also the circulation of a car, which is a bit less picturesque, perhaps. And then it's a scheme, which I guess, like La Roche, where it was a scheme which had been several distinct houses, which slowly through the design process merged into one. Yeah. The same sort of process seems to have gone here, where, but much more deliberately, where he's taken the shape from La Roche, or the first sort of principle where you have a long axis, a corner, and then a short, stubby thing, and broken that through the design development, which we have a few sketches of. He sort of tried out different configurations of these blocks. And the last one ends with it being quite like a dominant central piece with two wings in forming an L shape. And other than that, apart from the fact that there isn't very much lifting off the ground it's kind of like what we're going to see in that it's got a lot of roof gardens and terraces at different heights it's got a central principal important band and then it's got utility on the ground floor mainly for cars yeah just as in the gardens there's this sort of play of like pavilions in the garden in the circulation on the top floor of this guest pavilion there's a this sort of play where you can go out of one volume onto a balcony or terrace space and then into another volume they're, they're sort of pavilions on the roof as well as pavilions in the grounds but yeah absolutely it's picturesque it's fragmentary it's not really about unity it's about moving around and encountering these different things in the park it's got a lot of the stuff we talk about in episode one it has things which are semi-symmetrical 
and kind of classical approaches where you have a big thing flanked but unevenly from that point of view this film is actually quite quite a sort of a good although the shots are quite static you do get this sense that everything is always being framed at the end of a path or you're sort of seeing it far off through trees there are these different things which express at one point there's a there's there's a sort of raised walkway i can't quite understand how this all fits together but there's a kind of raised walkway bit which then defines almost like a colonnade underneath it it's all very confusing but kind of interesting like the others is a lot of showing off of circulation inside going to la roche it really it was just it's 60% 60% circulation and you're just walking around bits that you can walk around. Yeah, enjoying it. The other person can be over there, and you can be over there and you can wave to them. That's sort of the relationship and there's a bit of looking through. He also has a glass curtain wall in one place, uh, which is I think the first one of those we've seen. Yeah. Should we do five points? Because I think what we're going to encounter now, that was like a little bit of... Sort Filling of... in some of the gaps. Yeah. And also sort of, I think it's important to try and define that that's sort of where he was. I think that you can see a little bit of the domino approach still there in this sense that the variability in domino is about combining lots of volumes. You sort of have lots of these cuboids and you sort of stick them together into different shapes to exploit different sites or create different sorts of conditions. It's a bit, it's a bit reductive. That and also it's a concrete frame with columns, which actually I think is probably the single biggest thing in the five points should we say what they are let's say what they are but i just to contextualize it in one sense they're sort of summing up where they've got to but i think that this is also a point of inflection because the projects which they do after this and around this time are different and they start going in a different direction and we'll sort of see they move towards this more we can call it a kind of more purist approach or whatever we can turn it however we want, but we're, we're going to see that there's a transition in formal terms, which is going on, as well as this codification of principles. Yeah, I would say, like lots of things, what's happening is you've got this building up. Various ideas have been tried out in the early villas in the 20s, and it crystallises into an idea. There's a shining moment when the really famous villas are done, and then it stops. It cuts to a point, and then that's it and that's the sort of trajectory that happens various times in his career and is not uncommon it's basically where you're developing an idea you develop it and then it's done and then you can do something else and then you yeah. do something else and we, we're going to do the shining light ones yeah. so let's do five points so point number one is number one pilotes or structural supports no, uh, yeah columns 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 by, by which he means little largely cylindrical concrete columns which support a slab yeah. on a grid um, normally going right through the building. So while the walls, or even what is inside and outside, uh, will move, the column will go right from the footing to the roof garden, and it may become a support for a pergola. Can I just can I just read out this point, actually, because it's got various interesting things in it. So, to solve a problem scientifically means in the first place to distinguish between its elements. Hence... In the case of a building, a distinction can be immediately be made between the supporting and non-supporting elements. The earlier foundations on which the building rested without a mathematical check are replaced by individual foundations and the walls by individual supports. Both supports and support foundations are precisely calculated according to the burdens they are called upon to carry. These supports are spaced out at specific equal intervals with no thought for the interior arrangement of the building. They rise directly from the floor to three, four, six, etc. metres and elevate the ground floor. The floors are thereby removed from the dampness of the soil, they have light and air, the building plot is left to the garden, which consequently passes under the house. The same area is also gained on the flat roof. The the reason it's the first one is because I think really that's what drives all of the other ones. The structure that supports the building and the enclosure of the rooms are completely separate. In a way, the best thing probably to do to describe the effect of that is to go through the other points because the other points are, are implied possibilities once you've done that. This emphasis on making a distinction between supporting and non-supporting elements, it's about a kind of rationalisation or 
or sort of speciation, which doesn't necessarily have any justification, but it just sort of feels more rational. It kind of has a sort of rational affect without necessarily having any good reason to... I think it's also a way that he doesn't have to think about structure. I think one of the problems with the five-point schemes is the relationship between columns and walls is interesting dynamic but i don't think it's an ideal solution there are things going on which are not which are not rational but which are kind of interesting and that one of them is that this insistence on separating the columns i guess it's partly that you you also get rid of any kind of contingency there's no kind of like messy web of contingency structure is its own thing and in a way it's this universal uniform infrastructural thing which architecture is separate from and happens uh, in an expressive and autonomous way he's someone who in laying out works with an implicit grid anyway and making that grid explicit it's clear and he's also not someone who has a facility with structural engineering having that say well we're going to create a grid which is a constraint and once we've done that i no longer have to think about structure at all i just have a constraint that makes the process of designing yeah, it becomes liberated. Okay, so number two is... I, the thing I'm going to struggle on is the order. Is it free plan? No. Is it... Can't be roof garden. It's roof garden. Roof garden for yeah. number two. Number That's two. a funny old order to put them in. Yeah. That's sort of self-explanatory, isn't it? You have a flat roof and they, thereby you gain the whole of the space of the roof for garden. Thus you don't lose any garden. And... It's more like a terrace, and it can be used for, I think he says, sports, sunbathing, and pools. <laughs> uh, I don't see that here, but that no. sounds like a very plausible sort of specification. It may be in a, that may be in a different place. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he's not wrong, is it? Roof gardens are nice. Yeah. Terraces are lovely. They're lovely in cities, but I think they're great in terraces, terrace housing, but almost not existent. Yeah. I think it's one that's sort of something he really likes going back to all the way to um his happy sort of immediately post student days on the roof of Rue Franklin. He's on the roof of Rue Franklin, he's twenty years old, sunning himself in the studio flat of um his mentor. He's, he's, and he feels this you're elevated and it got that different light that you know, down at the street level it's dark, up just above it's light. Yeah, definitely. Healthful and light above the clamour of the city. Yeah, Rue Franklin, I saw a photo of the actual roof garden in Rue Franklin. Very sort of all the stranger for being quite precisely and laid out in a sort of neoclassical way, but yeah. within this. That's, that's very... Yeah. yeah, very strange. Should we go on to three? Yep. Is that free plan? Yeah, I knew it was quite early on. And that's that's the Pilates again. So draw in your head the rectangle, offset the dots into it. There's always that sort of cantilever around the edge of the frame of about a quarter of a bay or something like that. And then you can put the walls anywhere. And he illustrates that with some squiggles at one point, drawing S's and things. In reality, you don't do that. In reality, you do generally mostly put the walls between the columns, because otherwise you have a weird column in the middle of your room. The exception of some of the time the wall on the edge. So some of the time you'll have a little corridor in that little bit between the last column and the edge of the slab. But most of the time that that column will just be in the room. But it does mean you can have curving walls and walls can do anything. And the other key thing, I suppose, is that the walls don't at all have to match between floors. You can put them anywhere on every floor, which is a much more shocking thing then than now. Yeah, because actually in practice you often want rooms which are rectangular and which take up about half the floor plan or you know this kind of thing yeah. so one day we may get onto sana yeah 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 they're very impressive yeah they've pushed it they've got a strong commitment i haven't been and seen any of them but um... <laughs> a strong commitment indeed yes so no i think that's absolutely right uh number four Oh, the strip window, or the which he is actually in the french slightly different i think um we're using the canonic English translations, which were probably the ones done in the late 1920s. You can argue over them if you want. Strip windows. This means several things to me, one of which is that once you've got your column, you no longer need to break the fenestration for structural support. So if we think of our Chicago skyscrapers, you have a row of columns, and then between them you've got windows. 
you can have a strip window which goes almost all the way around, giving an unbroken view of the outside from the inside. And from the outside, it creates a flat plane, which has all sorts of interesting implications, which I think we'll get into later. Yeah, definitely. On its own, I'm not sure what else that means, other than once you've taken the column out of the wall and moved it back, the window can be continuous. And it can be any size. The whole history of architecture revolves exclusively around the wall apertures. Through use of the horizontal window, reinforced concrete suddenly provides the possibility of maximum illumination. Not very enlightening, but I mean, essentially, the the window can be 10 metres long or it can be 200 metres long or whatever. The illumination point, I think, is actually strip windows are bad for illumination, I think. What they're good for is views, looking at and looking through. The vertical window is great for illumination because at various different points of the sun's movement in the sky casts light deep into the plan and, and evenly across the plan, whereas the strip window concentrates that light in one place if it's shining on it directly, and if it's shining on it indirectly, it doesn't project ne- nearly as deeply into the plan, which is the other reason why you know classical windows are tall and thin, because yeah. you get lovely bright illumination deep into the plan. The strip window does have powerful effect, though. I think really one of the other technologies that enables them is electric illumination, which he's a real master of. And actually it isn't in his five points, but he's continuously using, well, I suppose, two lighting technologies, one of which is roof lights, which can crop up in all sorts of funny shapes and sizes, circles, little grids of squares, um, often not commented on, and also his ingenious use of electric lighting, which might be lots of lots of low-watt bulbs, either sort of recessed into some corner or in a long strip in the roof or in a fancy lighting channel. Oh, and then number five, we've already said it, but... Free elevation, free section. Yeah, the free, yeah, the, the free, the free facade, which is, which, I mean, we've, we've already said all of it, but the, 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 the external wall has been pushed away from the structure. That's not just the same as a strip window. It means that you can have a void where you want it you can have it semi-open you can have it completely glazed and you can arrange the rectangles on the facade however you please and that is a very important game for Corp. he likes that play of rectangles against the facade and against the implied interior and it also that the it allows you to start to treat the facade it, it allows it to be driven very strongly by a kind of graphical and proportional game of ar- arrangement yeah. um, because there are so few other constraints i guess as we said in mass housing again having that really narrow strip going right across the facade was a real uh, transgression against the expectation of what a facade looks like in a masonry world. I hope we've sort of showed what the five points are. In a way, you've seen them develop. They're the product of this line of thinking that starts with, we've got a concrete frame, we can infill it with rubble and build mass housing. And then he builds a series of villas and develops this system where the roof is on the top. I can do whatever I want with the facade, which in my case is doing a combination of kind of beautiful rectangle and transgression against masonry i can put rooms wherever i want them and i can lift the whole thing off the ground so that the living space is in the nicest state of elevation off the ground it's interesting the obsession we already talked about it didn't we the whole like gardens on roofs and the the ground the hovering above the ground thing it's a funny obsession he has this terror of the of the damp of the soil The first floor is nicer. He has a bit of an extreme response to it, perhaps. It's also quite upstairs, downstairs, isn't it? So on the ground floor, there are utilities like carport, uh, sinks and servants. You can also give the servants amusing um, hermit huts out in the ground. Yes, as we'll see. (laughs) I wouldn't say they are everything that's important. I think they miss off what for him is crucial, which is... The, the way you circulate both vertically and horizontally, like ramps. Do you really need two staircases and a ramp? 
Corp. Yeah, I can see why, actually. I think they're very, very powerful. But I think what he's doing with that is, I think, a real property of the vertical and horizontal lines of circulation, I think, are a really important point in these villas. Then also what he's trying to do formally with the kind of with the arrangement of form. So as I think with this next set of projects, yeah, he is looking to push circulation even further with this use of an exploration of ramps. And he's also trying to move away from these compositions which are fragmentary or piecemeal towards ones which express unity, a single primal perfect volume, normally cuboid, well, cuboidal. Although I think in terms of the, the form he actually tries out lots of different relationships. I don't think he ever comp- rejects the idea of having an assemblage. No, no, you'll come back to it in the 30s, I think. But I think it's really important that the that the, the classic purist villas, they are, he, he's really aspiring to do a very particular thing. And I think it's really good to actually be clear that that is a particular project and that, that, is a, that that's a transition, that that's a change that it has particular characteristics and then it's not just an effect of well he happened to do this particular thing at this particular time but he is there is something that he's really trying to go towards and a lot of the things which he develops during this set of villas that we're going to describe now also end up i think in other types of buildings which he'll design later that we'll start to see that he develops a whole this series of villas maya cook stein savoir the stuff which develops there is kind of really important and we we will see the, the sort of the principles of it coming up again and again. They are fundamentally pretty different. Talk about Villa Maya, which is, the I think, the earliest and also it's an unbuilt project. And it's quite strange. The plans which I have here don't honestly make it all that much clearer. One of the things which it is, is it's the first attempt that he makes to fully organise an entire house around the ramp as a means of circulation. And there's this early set of really strange plans in which you have circling at the centre of the plan this thing which looks like the ramp from a multi-storey car park going up and up with a void in the middle and with rooms around it on the outside. You yeah, can it see. starts as a circle and then it very quickly becomes flat. In a way, it's like the Guggenheim ramp. Yeah, it is. It's like a box house with the Guggenheim ramp in the middle of it. And actually, I don't know if it was contemporary with this, but he does also... um, There's a project which we can discuss um, when we look at the League of Nations, which is structured around a a ramp as well. So maybe there's some kind of communication between those two. In later versions, the ramp gets pushed out and becomes articulated as a separate form joined onto the house so that you have in the plan a big box which is all of the rooms and then you have this little lozenge thing which is dangling off the bottom of it which is uh which is this sort of faintly pointless ramp appendage which i guess you just sort of go up and down for fun or something and then and then the last one i think that is folded into a box but is on one edge of a void. So if you imagine a, a cube, and then you take out one quarter of that cube, yeah. maintaining the maintaining the outward walls, but there's a void, and then on the outside edge of that, you have a ramp that goes up and up and up and up, yeah. um, going through the various bits. There's so many versions, none of which are really definitive because it never gets built. Even in that version with the ramp, he still has sort of two and a half staircases, which also go up the whole way. Uh, or, or rather two that go up all the way and one that, that go, go, only goes up a little bit. I would say, apart from the ramp, the really interesting thing about this is the box. This is the first one which is really put inside a box. Partly because the site is boxed in. Yeah. In a way which the other ones weren't. But that means that he creates a cube, oblong-type cube, and the game then became comes a game of cutouts into it. So you've got the external wall or at least i mean that can have pretty enormous openings in it but all of the the goes are how can i arrange voids forms and circulation in this box uh and a lot of the energy goes in behind a facade which at the front is always a facade with two strips of windows and then 
stuff going on, on the ground floor which changes but it's it's like you've got this um really tight front which is quite constricted and then behind that there's a lot of movement it's all going on behind this kind of crisp facade and the rear elevation changes a lot which backs onto a garden the back can be ramps going up into a garden inside the house from the outside garden which may have the big ramp in it which may have a pool in it that high level garden may have a ramp which goes up to an even higher level garden but all of those things are cut out within the cube which always maintains a rear facade with i mean it may be 50% void but it, there's always enough of a plane there to denote a really sharp edge. There's another contemporary project called the Villa Ocampo, which he was designing in Buenos Aires, I think entirely by correspondence. It's just extremely similar in every way. There, are, There is a ramp which moves around the plan, various other things going on. Oh, well, the, other, the other thing that's going on is that there are various goes at having wibbly-wobbly walls, some of which are really peculiarly... So you've still got the grid of columns, including in the garden. But around, you can tuck a bath in around the back of a staircase or um, by, by having sort of the wall sinuously move. And there's lots of goes at that. Some, or well, most of them, are based on sort of manipulations of circles or things that would be quite easy to draw with kit. And then there's a couple of pretty free curves tried on a couple of the goes. There's also a nice set of drawings presented for the client to try and persuade them to fund it, which have really the, the views or different sort of notions of what he's trying to sell. The front elevation, this crisp box at the back, walkways coming out of the house into the garden, an internal space with swooping stair and the edge of a wall breaking up into curves. And he draws a lot of trees in the living room. Is sort of making that nod towards we're making this cut out literally trying to bring the garden into the building yeah. when we get onto the village stein he does this does sort of finally get done in a sense this sort of cut out and suspended garden he does a plan not on this but on another villa in this period where again he's going round and round this idea of ramps and a sort of mebius strip ramp appears in one of them but i can't i can't remember which one it is <laughs> it's very... really surely one bit of it would have to be walking upside down no sorry just like a figure eight one actually <laughs> in, yeah i mean actually i'm not sure it makes any more sense as just a figure eight ramp because i think in order to get your head height things it has to be so large okay so let's talk about the ramps he's already done them they start in la roche why ramps obvious question well there's this idea of a kind of architectural promenade around the house and the ramp is obviously interesting because it's this slow and continuous movement between around the plan and also between levels. So that it dramatises the transition between floors and then also if you have sort of double height areas, it creates this kind of slow and continuous, quite sort of cinematic movement through architectural space. Uh, I can think of that. I think also it creates an, another kind of sculptural line in a section. So if you're in a room, staircases are, are abrupt and pointy, as in as in they, they take up a corner, whereas a ramp has a curve which is kind of like the shadow of a roof line or something, or it's something which has got a which is where the energy is principally linear, but also if all your design is boxes, you then need to think about how do you create visual stimul stimulus within the language of boxes and the ramp is kind of like the shadow of a box. And it's also like, why on earth would you actually want them when no one's ever going to use them? You know, if you wanted to be cynical, you could do something like that. I mean, the first one that he does in Villa La Roche, there's this clear relationship between the ramp on one wall and the wall for displaying paintings on the other wall. And it's clear that he's had this kind of brainwave that here's a way to kind of additionally dramatise and draw attention to this thing which you're meant to be looking at well, why does he keep coming back to them um i don't know <laughs> really i mean in the film in the chanel film it's quite telling that that's what he shows most of in the villa savoir we have loads and loads of footage of this woman walking up and down the ramp multiple times filmed from different angles 
I mean, he's sort of fascinated by circulation anyway, isn't he? The circulation, the creation of views through spaces into other spaces, the enjoyment of moving around, moving around, looking around. Expressed, expressed movement. There's a, there's a big problem with boxes, isn't there? Yeah. It's sort of very it's static. Sold. Yeah. He's progressively making the box more interesting by cutting out and transgressing it with ramps. Yeah, I think that that's true, isn't it? In one sense, uh, he's he's very interested in the box because it's this figure of unity, but he doesn't want the composition or the the way in which you understand the building to remain static or to be sort of primarily static. He's interested or is clearly very animated by this tension between the expression of movement and the expression of of kind of wholeness and the, the tension between them. I also think there is, I haven't quite unpicked it, but I think the, um, what do I mean when I say it's a shadow? I mean, literally, if you project the corner of a cube onto a flat surface, you get the sort of shape that you get in the ramp, uh, which means that when you're looking out like through a window onto a ramp, If you flatten the perspective, you've got literally the sort of angles of the window you're looking at, and then you've got another set of angles, and that's a stimulating thing. But also somehow, it's like you've got, if you kind of rotate the thing through axes, you've got the staircase, which is this powerful circulation up, and then it feels like to me there's somehow a kind of a different shift of pace, which which is something that's difficult to create with something other than a ramp. Yeah, it's a different sort of... um... A different sort of form, I guess. Well, I think maybe we'll see some of this in the later projects because they are doing particular graphical things or they're doing particular things vis-a-vis the the facade and the the proportional relationships of it. Shall we alight briefly on Villa Cook, which is not like a hugely interesting um, project. It's this quite compact little house for... I think, was he a journalist? Uh, William Cook, yeah. William Cook. Journalist. Yeah, it's a city house and it's got strip windows on two floors and there's a few interesting things which you can see going on you can start to see these free plan walls developing in quite a restrained way but there are quite a lot of these undulating walls between rooms and there are little pockets and quite uh, kind of intricate lines that the wall takes between rooms to create a little pocket to hold a sink in or a little space for storage all of these sorts of other things so he's enjoying the possibilities of that there's also quite enjoyable correspondence between them because uh, i think they fell out (laughs) during the construction i think i'm pretty sure this is the client who wrote um a sternly worded letter to them telling them to stop sending people round to look at the house. <laughs> Fair enough. This, this, is a, this is an eternal problem. Something that's interesting is that at one point they highlight that the second floor window, the drainage holes on the second floor windows have been forgotten. So it's quite interesting that actually that thing which they did to the Villa La Roche yeah. to get rid of the condensation has become a standard detail by... Um, about 1920, 26, 27. Hi, it wouldn't pass standard robust detailing, would no. it? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, what are you going to do, do to do with the damp? Well, we'll just have holes. <laughs> they wrote a series of very strongly worded letters to him because they had installed the wrong kind of glass. I don't quite understand this. They say that they've installed window glass rather than plate glass. Window glass... I don't know which one window glass is. Plate glass is cast glass that's been polished to a flat surface, what you used at the time in shop windows, um, which is expensive and very flat. It doesn't have any ripples in it. Now, which one is window glass, whether that is like a crown glass? This is prior to float glass. So nowadays, all our um, glass is shunted out on molten tin, which means you can have continuous huge flat sheets of whatever thickness. But at the time, you had to either draw it, pull it, cast it, blow it, one of those things, and they tend to create some sort of wobble or ripple, which is now um, sumptuously sort of caressed. And Whereas at the time, I think probably would have been undesirable. It was inferior. He's, he writes this letter where he says, We visited your site today. Your windows had been glazed with window glass. 
window glass is quite out of place in this kind of construction, and not only spoils its appearance, but places it in an inferior category of buildings. I am quite convinced that you will readily agree to... Uh, blah, 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 blah. He wants him to upgrade it, and he's like, yeah, and you'll agree to, to avoid a serious blemish to your property. I'm not convinced that they actually whether they actually did replace it or not. Well, anyway. by now, it will have all been broken and replaced by float glass, which is basically the same as plate yeah. glass, so I'm sure he... Yeah. I mean, and there's not very much more to say to it. It's sort of quite... It's quite a nice little... I mean, little by the standards of the houses he was building. Yeah, so these are all quite big. <laughs> it's quite a nice big house, actually. Um, it's like a nice... It's a nice big two-bedroom house, I think. It's the first built one where the cube is being cut out and... There's some sort of circles in the plan, although no actual free curves. Yeah, it's got the same sort of control free career around furniture where his way of solving the problem of um, people putting paintings in the wrong places, you just cast everything in situ concrete. <laughs> so you can't go down the path of error. Um, at this point, the episode was getting a little long. Um, well, actually... The episode was very long, so we decided to split it here. The other, the second section will be coming up shortly. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Now this may be a silly song, but it's the latest fan. And every day we hear them say, "Spot and design till it drives us mad on land." In the air.